The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tyson. My partner, Malik Hill. And oh boy, it's already draft season, uh, June 22nd. And the NBA season is officially over. But we're already about to start the 2022-2023 season. It's very confusing nowadays. Um, the NBA Finals just wrapped up last Thursday. And pretty exciting, honestly, in, in my opinion. And it was a good series for the most part. Uh, there is one one downfall, I would say, from the series that we got. Uh, yeah, so we'll talk about that real quick, and then we'll get right into our NBA mock draft 2022. Should be an exciting draft. That will happen tomorrow night. So, finishing off the NBA Finals, Game 6, the Warriors went to work, and... Steph Curry solidified himself as the finals MVP. He ended up winning it. Warriors get their fourth ring in eight years, I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, and they're back on top. The, th- the interesting thing to me, I think, was Steph's emotion. Uh, thinking back about it now, I-, I understand it now. But in the moment, I was like, holy moly. <laughs> this dude is full he, he was letting it, He was letting it all go in those last seconds. Yeah, and... He, he had the tears flowing. Makes sense, though. The the injuries that the Warriors have had the last couple of years, I think, were pretty brutal. They won 15 games two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> People 15. forget they had one of the top picks in the draft and then multiple picks the following year. So they've been trying to work themselves back, and they found, they found themselves right back there, and they're back in the championship seat. And now they're the favorites again to repeat. So we'll have to wait and see. Um that's about all I have on the Warriors. Do you have anything you wanted to add about the Warriors in specific? And then we'll get to the Celtics. It was funny because the Celtics got out to like a 14-4 to lead, and mm-hmm. it looks like they were prepared to get it done. But it seemed apparently that was all they had left because after that, I think the Warriors went the rest of the first half, they went on like a 52-27 to run, Yeah, which is just insane. Yeah, I, I remember sitting on the couch because I was at my brother's uh, watching the game with a buddy of his and him and his buddy had a, a bet going that the Celtics would win the first quarter by three or something and it was looking really good for the longest time and then all of a sudden it felt like we looked down looked back up at the tv and the Warriors had like a 10 point lead and from there it just seemed like it was over yeah I mean Draymond he had his best game of the series mm-hmm. he was in complete control the entire time on both ends of the floor he hit two threes, which was completely threw me off. Yeah. Didn't you? Didn't you win a bet on him? I did. Hitting? Yeah, See, I, I only I don't needed know how him you to. Do it. I needed him to win to hit a three. Every all these games, and this is the game where you hit on him I, making. I, I, I placed. It. So it's funny because before the game started, I was trashing on Draymond Green, saying how terrible he was in the series and that he needed to step up. So then we started looking at some of the betting lines. He was the best odds. As far as like numbers, like he was plus eighteen hundred for first field goal of the game, and we didn't know how it was at the time. I didn't know exactly how it was defined. I couldn't remember. And so when Al Horford made free throws, my brother had Al Horford making the first basket. We didn't realize it was first basket, not points. So my brother didn't win, and we're like, "What the heck's going on?" And then the next play, Draymond Green gets the first field goal of the game, an actual bucket. So I hit on that because I picked him because I was like, oh, it's like plus 1,800. It's Draymond. You never know if they do some, like, screenplay and he gets some weird easy layup. That's kind of what happened. Yeah. And I immediately won 100 bucks off that. <laughs> and then I was – because I had already picked Draymond to make the first basket, I'm like, let's just do – his over for threes. He just needs to make one three, and I get 30 bucks. So 
I went all in on Draymond, even though I trashed him, and it, it worked out. So ridiculous. Your <laughs> level of luck, it, it kind of makes me sick. It has been pretty good lately. I'm not gonna lie. Um, you, you might have to teach me the ways because I haven't hit. <laughs> I have not hit. That's okay. It but happens. This, this is I didn't hit good. on my big parlay. But yeah, this this isn't the betting podcast. Uh, no, but we could start one <laughs> on how bad our bets are. I could get a few people involved if we yeah. did that. But, yeah, Draymond was in complete control. Jordan Poole got off to a hot start. Steph was steady all through the first half. Andrew Wiggins was doing his thing. Clay didn't have a good game. No. And people kind of expected game six Clay to happen, and it didn't. Yeah. But that third quarter, when Steph started losing it, mm-hmm. that was just – that three that he hit from, like, four feet behind the line, at that point you pretty much knew it was over. Yeah. Like, as much as Boston and Jalen Brown in particular tried their hardest to get back into the game and, like, try to take back the lead, Steph just wouldn't allow it. Mm-hmm. Every time they got closer, Steph would take Al Horford off the dribble and get an easy layup. He would hit a three. He would get an easy bucket again. He just – his, his greatness is just on a whole different level. At the top of the mountain for this generation is LeBron and Steph. Yeah. And it, it really can't be questioned at this point. With this this finals MVP, which a lot of people think he really didn't even need it. Right. His legacy was already secured, but now he has it, yep. plus a fourth ring. He's now 4-2 yeah. and two in the finals, which is one of the better records for all-time greats. Exactly. Uh, So he's... This is a debate that we have to talk about another day because it could go on forever, but he has made an argument to be top 10. I'd have to yeah. like look at the numbers to really put him in the top 10, but he's for sure. He's right 15. on the edge. He's for right sure. Top 15 edge. top 10 gets crazy. Cause it's insane. He kind of just, if he continues doing what he's doing, I think he's top 10 easy. Yeah. Um, but that's just how hard it is to get into that top 10. Um, so we'll talk about that another time. Now the Celtics, you kind of mentioned it. Jalen Brown had a good game. Al Horford tried to put the team on his back for a minute. He couldn't miss a three. There was a like two minute span where every three that both teams threw up just went in. Yeah, I think Horford finished with like 19 points, like 15 rebounds, and a block or two. Um, Robert Williams was crazy. He had five blocks or something on the game, and he was doing a pretty good job. Like when he had to go out there and guard Steph, he had that one block on him. Of course, Steph is going to drive past him a lot, but yeah. the fact that he can stand there and like go with Steph dribbling and dancing with him, it's really impressive yeah. what Robert Williams can do. And then Jalen Brown did really good of you know, doing what he does, getting to the basket, um, creating plays for himself. He did have his butter hands back out a little bit here and there, but for the most part, I think he was their best player in that game. Yeah. And uh, that the one, the, the one that we're not talking about. The big about. glaring problem. The guy Ooh. that uh the guy that made it very cringeworthy about yeah. his Kobe obsession. Yeah, we talked about it a little months. We talked it, about it a little bit last week. It. Yeah. Jason Tatum He wasn't ready. He did not have Kobe today. Or that day. Or the, the series. whole series. <laughs> he had a few really good games, but yeah. Overall it it just he couldn't do it. Yeah. I hope it's kind of an enlightening moment for his young career. Because yeah. obviously he's super talented. He's one of the best players in the NBA right now. But to start comparing yourself to Kobe and then come up really short and just not be aggressive, like Jalen Brown was doing what I expected Jason Tatum to be doing, going to the basket more, not settling for jumpers, just using his size and his off-the-dribble capabilities. I just never saw it. It's When the lights got brightest, it, it just – he really shrunk. Yeah. And I was surprised. This is the same guy that dunked on LeBron as a rookie right. mm-hmm. in the Eastern Conference Finals. And even in earlier in some of the earlier se- series, he played really good. He had some really good games uh, to almost carry Boston. So, yeah, I, I I don't know if he just took the Kobe thing a little too far or what, but that might be a part of it. He might have just ran out of gas, got in his own head because I, he shouldn't have to be the best playmaker on the team. Right. And that's what he became in these playoffs. Yeah. He took on all those responsibilities plus being the go-to scorer. And I I talked to you during the Eastern Conference Finals. I was saying he defers too much mm-hmm. in the last minutes of the fourth quarter especially, but every quarter. He yeah. tends to defer way too much. Right. 
And, yeah, in these moments, even when he had the ball, he would just get stripped or he would dribble to the rim and just have no plan. His his inability to attack and score at the rim was the most alarming thing. And I'm not sure what it was. Because like you said in earlier series, it didn't seem like much of a problem. When right. he wanted to get to the rim, he would figure out a way and he would either, either score or get fouled. Yeah, It was something about this team and this series that just made him just disappear in those moments. Yeah. Unfortunate to see. Kind of made the series not boring, but you didn't get to see all the stars, I guess. But again, like you said too, Clay didn't have a very good series. So, um, yeah, it was just interesting. So, NBA season's over. Kind of crazy. Seemed like it come came and went really quickly. And now we're already in the off season because the NBA draft is tomorrow. Yeah, uh, they moved. They moved the draft up a week, right? Or something um, like that. Maybe a couple weeks. Maybe at least no, recently. It, I don't know it, if it, it was, usually is like the twenty eighth or 29th, I think. Of yeah, this I don't. Month, I can't so remember yeah. if it was this year that they moved it up or last year or whatever. They they did move it up like five or six days, I believe. Yeah. So it's exciting for us because we can get right into stuff. Um, but it's just it's just crazy that the off season's already beginning and there's already crazy swirling rumors of free agency and trading and all sorts of stuff. And I expect this year's to draft to be similar to last year's where. Anything is possible, especially for the Pistons. Um, I think they have a lot of options. And we've kind of talked about some of the players here and there. So I say we just get right into this mock draft and start uh, going from there. Today, we decided Malik's going to get the first pick. I got the first pick in the NFL draft. Um, so Malik this year is going to get both Detroit picks, both in the NFL and NBA. So Malik, you are on the clock for the Orlando Magic. Listen. What are we doing? This... This has been a long time coming for the, for our franchise. Uh, we got Shaq in 92. We drafted Chris Webber in 93, but we did that trade for Penny, and then things got rolling. Didn't work out. Penny got hurt. Shaq left to L.A. Mm -hmm. Got Dwight Howard in 05. Actually, we, we had team back in between, but that was more free agency. We drafted Dwight Howard in 04. Got us to the finals. Could never get back to that level. Now we're back in this number one spot again. And this is tough. You got a, you got a, you got a good young core in Orlando. Mm -hmm. A lot of pieces that are that appear to be keepers. And do you have an option between two big men specifically? Oh, you're saying two. Yes. Now the betting books have changed. They I think Paolo is now up to number two for odds of being the number one pick. It's possible, I'm just but saying, I, I'm just yeah, saying. it's possible, but I don't think it's likely. I think this comes down to Chet Holmgren and Jabari Smith. Mm -hmm. Two different types of players. Chet Holmgren, the seven foot, seven one, just overall highly skilled on both ends player, and his downfall is his size. Jabari Smith is the best shooter in the draft at six ten. I think he's a souped-up LaMarcus Aldridge. Mm -hmm. That's what I've heard a lot of comps be. And it depends on what do you want next to Wendell Carter because he is your guy at the four or five, whichever one you want to slide him into. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I'm going to take a shot with this rebuilding process. Jamal Mosley is in his second year as coach. You hit on Franz Wagner. You hit on Cole Anthony. Still hoping Jalen Suggs hits after the ups and downs of last year. I think you take a swing on Chet Holmgren. Okay. With the first pick. I don't think this is a process you can rush. I don't think Jabari Smith would be necessarily rushing the process. But this is something that is three, four years away. Maybe two if they get lucky, but I don't really see it. Yeah. And I think Chet Holmgren is a prospect that is – you you draft him because of what he will become three or four years down the road. He already can block the shots. He already can hit jumpers from mid-range and three. He already can get rebounds and go coast to coast comfortably. He dribbles like a guard at his size. He has all these things, but 
He just needs to play. Mm-hmm. He needs to play in NBA games. He needs to get used to the style of play. He needs to get used to the whether can you even call it physicality today? Yeah. There are there are people there are a lot of players with big bodies that know how to use them. Yeah, and, and I think yeah. Chet, I think Chet's one of them. Uh, he is undersized due to his weight, but the one thing that people have always said is that he plays stronger than he is. Yes, whatever. He knows how to use his leverage. He's very tough. He's not going to shy away from things, which is sometimes what you fear at guys his size. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's my number one. Like, if I had the number one pick, that's who I'm taking as well. It will be interesting to see what the Magic will do because they've kind of been linked to all three of those top big men. Um, so yeah, it should be interesting. Yeah, what what you said is the reason why I took him number one because it's rare for a guy with his size to be as mentally tough as he is. Yeah. He's going to hit the ground a lot. And people are going to laugh at him a lot and they're going to say he's too small. He's going to get dunked on a bunch of times as many times as he blocks shots. But I think he's going to get up and keep going every. He won't stop talking. Yeah. Well, he's not a big talker, but if you talk to him, he will talk back. Right. He won't be phased and he's going to keep getting up. Yeah. And he's a guy too. And he has Wendell Carter next to him who's the tougher. He's I mean guy, the, the bigger. He's option. the guy that can play both sides of the ball. Like, a lot of people were comparing him. Now, of course, it doesn't seem like it, but once you start to think about it, Al Horford. He can put up points. He can put up rebounds, assists, blocks. He can do a little bit of everything. You just don't know if he'll ever be, like, a 20-plus point scorer. That's, like, his only question mark. Yeah. Is can he be an elite scorer in the NBA? And he also didn't get to show all of his game at Gonzaga. Right. He played a specific role yeah. on both ends. And at the same time, I don't think you necessarily need him to be a 20-point plus score exactly i don't think that's why you draft chet holmgren i think he's just an all-around really really good player Uh, you will get those games where he has big scoring nights but yeah yeah. well makes it easy on me the thunder are running up to the board they're picking jabari smith um this is they need shooting yeah i i agree that chet and jabari are top two but i just always bring in paulo because people forget paulo at one point was the number one player in this draft yeah and some people do still think that he is, um, and he very well could be. But I'm just going with upside. I think Jabari Smith is great. Like you said, he's like almost a 40% sh- uh, shooter from three. Granted, that'll change in the NBA. I think it, his percentages will go down a little bit. Um, but he's like super athletic, and he's got more room to grow, which I think is really interesting. I think it's an easy pick, Jabari Smith, at three yeah. I, or two. I think he's the one player – even though I think Paolo is the most talented player in this class, I think Jabari Smith has the ability, especially if he keeps getting better, he has the ability that wins you playoff series. Yeah. Like, you need guys that can consistently hit jumpers in people's faces. Like, the like there's nothing in front of them. They're unfazed. Whatever move they make, they, they get their jumper off clean and it's going in. Mm-hmm. I think he's one of those guys that where, whether it's mid-range or three-point, I don't think he'll ever need to develop, like, high-level handle. Yeah. Now his hand his handle does need to be more tight since he gets rebounds and goes coast to coast sometimes. But he's a guy like Lamarcus Aldridge, which I compare it to where face up, jab steps, maybe one crossover move, enough space to get that jumper off because it's clean. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree with that number two. All right, the Rockets are on the clock. Uh, we as, got as, as easy as it seems. It is. <laughs> it is. There there's no trade thoughts. You got Jay, You got a bunch of talented guards, talented raw guards that have to keep improving. Your big man, you got Christian Wood, who just got traded. Yep. He's to the Dallas Mavericks. He just traded Christian Wood to Dallas. I can't remember what Houston got back. I wish I could remember that. Part. Um, I believe they got a pick, I think. Okay. Did they get their 26 pick? The Mavericks have the 26 pick. That might okay. be what they got. Yeah, but they just they traded Christian Wood. They're making open space. You got Alperin Shingun from last year, who impressed in his rookie season. And I think besides that, you don't have many keepers. Yeah. In terms of big men. So yeah, you run <laughs> you run up to the to the stage and you take Paolo. Because he is the most talented overall player in this class. He's six ten, two fifty, strong, he has handle. He has a nice jumper. It's inconsistent at times, but when it's falling, it looks great. Mm-hmm. He's super athletic. 
Now, there are some issues where I think maybe, I don't know, I don't know if his defense will be emphasized in, in Houston. They're, those young guys get a lot of, um, they get a lot of like extra leniency to do whatever they want mm-hmm. in Houston right now. And I wonder when they're going to start to like play really high quality basketball. I'm afraid that Paolo can be a, he could be a guy that averages 25 on a bad team. And I don't want that to be what this Houston situation is, mm-hmm. but we're still taking him. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, you can't pass up on that level of talent pairing him with Jalen green and those guards and Alperin Shingun. It could be scary. Yeah. But he, he has to care more about defense and he has to give more effort consistently at all times, not just in short glimpse glimpses like the NCAA tournament. Yeah. All right. Um, here are the details on that Dallas Mavericks, Houston Rockets trade. Um, Dallas gave up, um, Boban, sad day for Boban to be moving again. Sterling Brown, Marquise Chris, Trey Burke, and the 26 pick. So not too much, mostly for the 26 pick. Um, And Dallas gets Christian Wood to put themselves a little bit closer to win now. They're probably only keeping like maybe two of those players that they traded for. Yeah, They'll probably cut most half of them. Yep. Um, The other thing I'll I'll say real quick on the Rockets at three – I think this is where trades come into play. Um, I don't think they're going to, but the Rockets have been linked to wanting to trade out of the pick. I don't know what they're. I don't know what they're looking that's for. That's why I said I don't know why they would want to trade um, out. Of that. Especially why would you trade Christian? Why would you trade him and then not take Paolo? That wouldn't make right. much sense. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe they just want more picks. That, that's always a possibility. But yeah, it, it seems odd to me. So I got the fourth, the fourth pick. And the Kings are where the draft starts. No, yes. That, I don't think we said it to start. There there are situations where we'll get to a pick and we'll say this is where I believe this team or I, if we're the GMs, this is where we would trade. Yeah. So I assume this is the first position where you might bring up Yeah, this is where we might. So yeah. for the longest time, the Kings were linked to being available to trade this pick. Now, what has been happening the last couple of days is that the Knicks have talked to the Kings. The Pistons have talked to the Kings. Apparently, the Kings are wanting a Kings ransom for this pick. Um, the Knicks, I, I believe, offered one of their young key players uh, and their 11th pick for the four, and the Kings said no. So I don't know what it would take to get to the four. Honestly, if I was the Kings, I think I'd take that. Like, if you could get Emmanuel Quickly, Obi Toppin, or who else did they say? Quentin Grimes for the 11 and the 11th pick. That might be better than what you can get at four or what you're looking for at four, in my opinion. Because, like, you might get at 11 a guy like you could get Tari Eason, who I think would be great for them to be in this win now mode that they think that they're in. Plus, you get a, another guard or something like that, or Obi Toppin, or however you wanted to deal that. I think they should trade out of it, but it doesn't look like they're going to. So I, in this scenario, I would say if I was the Kings, I would trade out of this position to get the best that you can. Don't go too crazy asking for too much because I think no matter what, you're going to get something better than what you draft here at four. Now, the next thing I'll say is also if I was the Kings, I would draft Jaden Ivey here at four, but I'm not going to do this for this mock draft. One, because it screws the Pistons. I don't want that. But two, I think the Kings are just so dumb they wouldn't do that. Because I think you draft Jaden Ivey because he's best available, and then you could still field trade offers afterwards. I was just about to say, if you draft him, is it primarily as an asset? Right. That would be my thought. Um, And if you don't like him as an asset, or you do, then do you try to shop Davion Mitchell or De'Aaron Fox? That wouldn't make sense, but yeah. that's a Kings type of move. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's all I'm saying. So for this mock draft purposes, all jokes aside, Kings are going to do crazy things. I'm going with Keegan Murray. I think he's the most ready available player. It's what they're looking for. They don't need to really work him too much into the offense, I don't think. I think he'll fit pretty perfectly. 
it's funny because to me, Keegan Murray is very similar to Harrison Barnes in a way that they're like kind of quiet scores, but then all of a sudden they have 25 points. I think he just fits there. I'm going with Keegan Murray at four. Who knows what they're going to do tomorrow night? And that's where I'm getting nervous and excited for yeah, the draft. I, I think that makes the most sense. I agree with all your points. And also the fact that the only team Keegan Murray has worked out for and has had dinner with, I believe, Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox is Keegan Murray. He, he's spent a bunch of time in Sacramento, even if it's only a day. So, yeah, it would make sense for the Kings to do this because apparently they have a quota that they want to win now, which doesn't make much sense. But, yeah, they're the Kings. So, moving on to our pick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even though you're on the other side, this is, this, is, this is all of our pick. This is the state of Michigan, city of Detroit's pick. There's no wasting time on this. To me, I don't think there's a choice between Ben Matherin and Jaden Ivey. Yeah. I'm not taking swings on anybody else. This is definitely not a Dyson Daniels pick. No, sir. Okay. You pick Jaden Ivey and you don't look back. I think he could be a fantastic fit with Cade and Sadiq at the two in the starting five on this team. Mm -hmm. He can take pressure off of Cade, bringing up the ball, and sometimes making decisions because he did have some point guard responsibilities at times at Purdue because the ball was in his hands so many times. His season didn't end well against St. Peter's. The team played horribly and he played horribly. But when you look at what he did and what his skill level is, it's, you just can't pass up on this. Yeah, He has young D-Wade type athleticism and explosion. He has the pedigree with his mom being a former pro and a coach. He's worked out for only Detroit and Orlando. Yep. Uh, this is the type of guy. That's you what need. scares me, though. He's only worked out for Detroit and Orlando. He's kind of bad mouthed the Kings slightly. The Kings are the type of team that they're just going to say, <laughs> "We're taking you anyway, buddy." Yeah, but yeah, I I don't I don't see how you don't take Jaden Ivey. Yeah, he's a he's a great addition to the Pistons and continues their rebuild process that's been yeah pretty successful so far. I agree with you. It allows Cade to be. Um, not always uh, dribbling the ball that he can fade to the corners and things like that and still be dangerous. Um, but it just gives you another guy that's an attacker. Um, the Pistons kind of play a, a spread out offense. So Sadiq can spread out. Cade can spread out. Jaden's not the greatest shooter right now. So he'd be the guy taking the ball to the basket. Um, hopefully get a pick and roll game with Marvin Bagley going. Yeah, having two guards like Cade and Jade and Jaden that could both cut to the rim. Yeah. And attack the rim is, yeah. Right. I agree. All right. I got the Pacers at six. Pacers are in full rebuild mode. They're shopping Malcolm Brogdon at this point. It's just, it's it's crazy because I thought the Pacers were, I mean, they were like a playoff team a couple years ago. And now they've turned into a full rebuild. They've shipped Demonis Sabonis. They're looking to ship Malcolm Brogdon. Now they have their point guard of the future. They lucked into Halliburton. Yeah. They're also already shopping Chris Duarte, apparently. They're at least fielding him in, in some of their offers. Um, so we'll see what happens. I'd assume they're shopping Buddy Heald, too. I don't, Probably. I'm, yeah. I'm sure everybody basically is on the table at this point. Full rebuild mode, this is perfect for Shadon Sharp, in my mm-hmm. opinion. If you're going full rebuild, what other better player to take than a guy that nobody knows about? He could be the best player in this draft, but we're not – 100% sure. It's going to probably take some time. He's got to get back up to speed. Hasn't played since high, since high school, but I mean, he's got all the pieces. He's talented. He's athletic. I don't know why the Pacers wouldn't take him here, I guess, is my my humble opinion. I'm taking Shadon Sharp at number six. I honestly, I don't know why I didn't consider Shadon Sharp to Indiana, but it makes total sense especially the way you you explain it. Yeah, having a guard like that next to Tyrese Halliburton plus some athletic bigs like Isaiah Jackson and Jalen Smith, that'd be pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, number seven, the Portland Trail Blazers. Another interesting This one. is such a confusing organization I am in for these next, like, three minutes. They are wanting to retool around Damian Lillard. Mm-hmm. They have no plan to rebuild, but it's a roster full of, who knows? I mean, you 
you got Anthony Simons who you hit on. Congratulations. It looks like he's a young star. Yeah. Averaging like 20 a game with Dame out and just lighting people on fire. Josh Hart put up big numbers <laughs> when Dame was out. Cool. Mm-hmm. But your big man that you invested in for some years is the injuries are starting to get him out of here. And the rest of your roster just isn't. It's not doing it. Nasir Little, I don't know if he's going to take a next step. This is a situation where I don't understand why they would keep the pick. If I was the GM, I would look at every trade possibility to either move up or move back so another team could move into our position and we can get more quality players. Right. But I don't know, man. In this situation, because they have Dame and Anthony Simons, I'm not going to reach for a big – I, I don't think I'd reach for Jalen Duren in the situation, hmm. even though the big man isn't looking that great at this point. Okay, so let's take a pause then before we make a, a like a what we would do if we had the pick. Let's do the two trade scenarios that we've heard the most. Yeah. Obviously, our favorite, the Pistons trade Jeremy Grant for the number seven pick. There might be a couple other assets that we have to involve, maybe a future pick, maybe another role player. That would obviously be the best case scenario for the Pistons. Now, would you take Jeremy Grant plus maybe a couple little assets or the other big talking point that I've heard from the Blazers, John Collins from Atlanta to the Blazers? Would you rather, if you're the Blazers, try not to be biased here, would you rather have Jeremy Grant or John Collins? For a retooling process, you would take John Collins. I think I agree. You would. But here's the thing. I think Jeremy Grant might be a better fit next to Dame. Seeing how good of a defender he is and how he doesn't, I think John Collins, he needs a lot of touches to get going. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Grant has shown that he can be the third guy and be still be highly effective. I don't think that's John Collins' thing. Yeah. But yeah, in, in the moment you take John Collins, but since we just, I have to make a pick. So, I'm I'm just gonna add some shooting and some strength and potential high level defense and AJ Griffin from Duke. Okay. Six seven, almost like two fifteen, two twenty. He's strong. Showed signs of being a really good defender, could get better. Shot like high forties in, in three point percentage. I don't think that sticks. But he could be a better version of a guy that was next to Dame a few years ago. He could be a better version of Al Farouk Aminu. Mm-hmm. At the least, he should be able to be that. Yeah. Yeah, Al Farouk became a dependable 3 and D guy. And A.J. Griffin should be a higher, le- higher level version of that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, A.J. Griffin. All righty. And I get the Pelicans pick. How fitting. Yeah. And actually quite hey, difficult. Have, have you seen the, the videos of Zion, the Jordan commercial, and how he's looking fit? There's been a lot of uh, pictures rolling around of him in the gym. It's a good sign. It's a good sign. Yeah. Maybe last year was just a fluke. Maybe it's just a thing. Um, There's a lot of positivity in New Orleans right now, surprisingly. Yeah. After I mean, that surprise run. If Zion comes back, this team, they're going to be fun. They're going to be dangerous. So what do you do? Whew. You got McCollum. You got Ingram. Zion coming back. You got you got your starting lineup. Yeah, this is tough. You got your guy. And you got Herb. Yeah. You have you a lot Alvarado. Of, you got a lot of quality pieces, got a hard working team. So I think you have to go with the theme at this point. Going with hustle guys, guys that can do multiple things. If Ben Matherin falls to eight, because he keeps climbing up boards, I think the Pelicans are loving that pick. He's a better shooting Herb Jones almost. He's kind of long. He's defensive. Maybe not as defensive as Herb Jones. Yeah, he uh, he who knows, he might, but I don't think he'll be as elite as right. Herb is from but what he, he was from the jump. He has a similar play style, but he's more offensively oriented. Yeah, he's a he's a true Herb. two guard. Just in the style of just being lanky and long and athletic. So I think I think for me, this would be an easy pick to take Ben Math Ben Matherin here for the Pelicans. I like it. Honestly, I think if I had it, I might have taken a swing on Dyson Daniels. See, I thought about that. That was I my other. Have. That was my other thought. I, I'm just not sold. I'm just not sold. I mean, I and you've I, already yeah. found like a backup guard in 
Jose Alvarado, who plays really tough. Yes, maybe he's not as talented, but I think he just fits the the role pretty well. I can understand that. So, pick number nine. San Antonio. You got an all-star point guard who's breaking out. Lonnie Walker is I don't think he's becoming what they expected. He's got all the talent in the world, but it's just not coming together. Mm-hmm. They drafted Josh Primo last year, which just com- confused everybody. All He got better as the season went on, so he might not be a failed thing. Jakob Pertl has actually been really good for them. Mm-hmm. Underrated, honestly. You got Kelton Johnson. You You got some solid pieces. Yeah. But then you got some other pieces that I don't know if you can fully trust. I think Doug McDermott, I don't – was he signed on a multi-year deal? I can't remember if he's out the I door or not. I don't know not. anything. Yeah. But he I, – I don't think he's going to be <laughs> anything important for them in the future. Zach Collins, who knows? Mm-hmm. Who who knows what Zach Collins can be? Yeah. Trey Jones, decent backup point guard from Duke. You got an all-star guard and then a bunch of questions. And Jakob Pertl, who's pretty decent. Yep. In this situation, they could take a chance, but I'd like to bring somebody in that kind of that fits the culture, has that upside, and isn't too raw. So, yeah, I think I'm – yeah, I think I'll go Jeremy Sohan out of Baylor. That's a very Spurs pick. Yeah, he's six eight, almost six nine. He's like two forty, close to two fifty, and he can do almost. He can do a little bit of every. He's not elite at one thing, mm-hmm. but he's good at almost everything. High energy, good defense, solid three point shooter, but not like a reliable three point shot yet. Yeah, but he has a good like jumper. High energy, high energy on offense too. So he's going to get offensive rebounds and putbacks, and will go to the free throw line a lot. Mm-hmm. A guy that next to Keldon Johnson and Jakob Pertl, I think if you slide Jeremy Sohan in at the four, I think there are a lot of games where they steal they steal games away just by being better at the the little things Mm -hmm. diving for loose balls, offensive rebounds, steals. I think if you draft Jeremy Sohan, you improve, even if it's just slightly, you improve in that category and you start stealing some games from better teams that like are taking nights off. Yeah. And they, they got into the playing game this past year. So yeah, I, I, I go with Jeremy Sohan. All right. I like that pick. Um, okay. We got the Wizards on the clock now. This is another kind of weird one. Wizards are kind of just, I would say, looking for somewhat best available. Um, they are expecting Bradley Beal to re-sign for them. So their depth charts looking like Thomas Sadoransky, Bradley Beal, KCP, uh, Kyle Kuzma, and Kristaps Porzingis. They surprised some people last year, won a few games. Um so they think they can still make a run. Originally, I was thinking of going along the lines of a um, Tari Eason. I really like his play. Um, I think he could give you something big. But the more that I thought about it, they have Rui off the bench. They have Denny Avija, Avija that they're still trying to get into form. So like, I think they're good in the forward position. That guard position is where they need the most help, and I think they're at the point where they need the most ready guy. And I'm still not willing to take Dyson Daniels. I'm going with who they're projected to take um, from a lot of mocks, Johnny Davis. I don't like Mm -hmm. him myself. That's besides the point. But I think that if he works out the way he did in college in the NBA – He'll be great to pair alongside with Bradley Beal. He'll take some offensive pressure off if he needs to. Um, it just gives them another offensive weapon. And, yeah, I'm going with Johnny Davis for the Wizards. 
I just got a text from I Chris know. that just. <sighs> yeah, it hurts our soul. So our he friend just... Chris Pappas has <laughs> blown up our phones about Ben Matherin for this draft because he has let everybody else just get him completely bought in on Ben Matherin. Yeah, well, that's after. Chris. That's Chris Pappas for you, everyone. Um, so he's talking about how Detroit seems like they want Ben Matherin. My thought is that they think that the Kings are going to be sold on Jaden Ivey and just maybe hold him, or they will end up going with a trade. So I think that's kind of where the Ben Matherin love for Detroit has been coming in. Um, that's just my biggest reason. So we'll have to wait and see. We'll get to Chris later. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we can talk about what Chris's feelings are next week. Um, he just said, I'm um, in caps all in. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the Knicks. The 11th pick, the New York Knicks. Now, the Knicks are, like I said, they are trying to move up. Yeah, they, they want the Kings pick. They made it clear that they want to move up, which is, I, I'm assuming they'll trade up within the top 10 somehow. Yeah. And trading away most of their young pieces is confusing to me because <laughs> yeah. it seems like that's what they're, the most important part of their team is. Mm-hmm. All the young, the older guys they signed have been the problem right? outside of D-Rose. But – you got Emmanuel quickly, and the rest of the guards are older. <laughs> yeah. You got Kimba. You got Fournier. Quentin Grimes is a shooter. Uh, RJ is more of a three. Deuce McBride gets a few minutes, but he's not playing a lot of minutes. Yeah. In this spot, I think I'm taking Ty Ty Washington out of Kentucky. Hmm. Had a good freshman season. I think people expected more. Quality shooter, good scoring off the dribble, kind of like quickly in a way. Mm-hmm. Not that great on defense, also kind of like quickly. <laughs> so I I don't I don't know if I have like the highest level of confidence in this pick, mostly because we both think the Knicks are going to trade up. Right. I I don't think they're going to draft a big because they have Jericho Sims and. I don't know if they're going to let Mitchell walk, Mitchell yeah. Robinson. So, yeah, I I just go with Ty Ty Washington. Yeah. Another guard that can score. Okay. Yeah. This is where I think I would have taken Dyson Daniels. I think this is an okay spot to do it. I don't love Ty Ty Washington's game. That's kind of why I say it. I think I'd go with the upside of Dyson Daniels being basically a six 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 seven point guard. Um, that I think that's where I take the uh, – the risk there, but I don't mind the pick, but yeah, I think the Knicks are most likely the ones to try to try to move up at some point. I don't know how far they can get up there, but I'm sure they will at least love to get to seven. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I think after Frank Nilakina, they'll be too scared to, to take Dyson Daniels, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. They, they've had too many failed projects from overseas. Mm-hmm. Chris Stapps was their one that hit. Yeah. All right, the Thunder. They get to pick again. They're at 12 now. I don't really know what the Thunder need, per se. Do they keep this pick? <laughs> they might. They, they might, might just keep it. They might and just get more assets. They're going to have first-round picks for years to come. So maybe the Thunder are another interesting one because they also have the 30th pick. They could like yeah. pair 30 and 12 to move up, potentially, if they wanted to. Or get out of it if they wanted, for something. I don't know what, but I know who I'd take here. Do you? Yeah. Is it the guy you've been doing research on? No. Okay. No. Um. For me, maybe I'll be a little biased, just because I like his game. I'm gonna take Tari Eason here. I just like his game. I think he's one of the better players available at this point. Um, can score the basketball well. Uh, and I think the Thunder don't necessarily need a particular thing at this point, in my opinion. I guess you could go with you could go with Jalen Duran. I guess that's a good yeah. Was that your pick? That was gonna be okay. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, if you want us to back to back power forwards. It's interesting, but well, if you have Tari Eason off the bench, that's that's kind of le- that's pretty lethal. Yeah. Well, my opinion, my thought is that too that you could, those guys are kind of inter- like, 
I almost feel like you could turn one of them into a three, even though Jabari Smith is 6'10". You could. Tari Eason's 6'8", so he's more likely to play that forward. Yeah. I think they're athletic enough that they could do that. Um, so that's my thought. I'll stick with my pick. Okay. Jalen Dern pick, I do like that. I for- kind of forgot about that, that they don't really have a true center. Um, so, yeah. But I'm going to go with Tari Eason. I think he's still a great player. Um, can give you buckets at times. There's always a few teams in the lottery that take a swing. So Right. So I'm going to go with Tari Eason. I just like his game, so I'm I'm a little biased. Okay. 13, you gave it to me. You threw me the oop. This is what Charlotte honestly needs. Yeah. This type of rim, rim running, big, athletic, strong, big man. At 13, Charlotte takes Jalen Duran. LaMelo needs this type of guy. Yeah. That he can trust to come out of the pick and roll and catch lobs. And they need a defensive anchor. Mm-hmm. They really need one of those guys. Yeah. And I think Jalen Duran could become that. So, yeah, like the the Robert Robert Williams is kind of becoming like the the prototype of this type of center. Yeah, and what any team that has a player like that is better for it. And I think Charlotte is much better in that in their position they're in, getting Jalen Duran yeah. as a young big man. Mm-hmm. All righty, I have the Cavs at fourteen. Cavs are another team that I don't they're know. In a, they're in an interesting spot because they, yeah. they have almost all of their young core. Right. This could be a, another potential trade thing, but I'll, I'll yeah. let you go. Um, My thoughts right now, just off the top of the head, they've been trying to get on get off of Colin Sexton for a while. We just saw what they could be without Colin Sexton. Darius Garland stepped up, looked Incredible. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at a guy now to pair back up uh, with Darius Garland. And I don't know if Darius Garland wants to keep being more of the actual point guard. Because when they first brought him in, they thought he might be the shooting guard to Colin Sexton and be taking more of the shots. But he did a really I think, good I think Garland is more. He, he does do the balance of point guard more yeah. well than Colin Sexton. Right. So in that scenario, I think I'm going with Malachi Branham. Hmm. Just a shooter. It's kind of what they need. Somebody to score. He's, he's an overall scorer, too. I, I, hmm. Yeah. I'm going to go with Malachi Branham. I think that's a good fit. That is a pretty nice pick. Ohio State fans were pretty sad that he didn't come back. He was a, he was a major surprise to me. I knew he was like a four-star guard. And a guy that can get some buckets, but in the Big Ten schedule, in the Big Ten schedule, especially in the second half of the season, he was almost unstoppable. Yeah, like the last 10, 12 games of the season, mm-hmm. he was averaging like twenty four, mm-hmm. and was just killing everybody. So, yeah, from Ohio State, I think he's from Ohio too. So that'd be a, that'd be a pretty good pickup for Cleveland. I like that pick. Yeah. Um, before you go to the Hornets pick, I just want to say, I'm expecting the Hornets to trade one of these picks, thirteen or fifteen. They're another candidate to do it. Um, I would say if the Pistons can't get the seven pick from the Blazers, I would trade Jeremy Grant for the 13th pick, maybe the 15th pick, depending on how the the draft goes, because the Hornets are also trying to offload Gordon Hayward. So if we wanted to boost our rebuild, I think taking a veteran like Gordon Hayward and getting that 13th or 15th pick to be able to go get a guy like Jalen Dern or Mark Williams would be amazing. I think that'd be just as good as the seventh pick, honestly. Yeah. In my mind. There is there is that trade scenario option. But with this pick, I am going to go with a kid that's dropped. I don't know how far he will drop in the draft tomorrow night. But it's been obvious for the past season, the since LaMelo has been in the league these first two seasons. Gordon Hayward was the only good playmaker outside of LaMelo on the team. Mm -hmm. Nobody else could make plays. Nobody else was a very good passer. And it was just a bunch of AAU ball and and ISO scoring whenever the ball wasn't in LaMelo's hands. I think you need another person that can slow things down and make good plays. This kid has size. He's still raw on offense, but he has time to grow. 
and he's good on defense. And under the right coaching, he can work very well with LaMelo and coming off the bench as another playmaker. Mm -hmm. Dyson Daniels to the Charlotte Hornets. LaMelo needs help in the playmaking department since Gordon Hayward can't stay healthy. So in this situation, I will take him. Yeah, I like that. All right, the Hawks at 16. Great, I another that. team in trade rumors. Another playoff team, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if I'm the Hawks, I'm trying to trade this pick. Almost get whatever you can. But in the sense that they have to keep the pick. Um, I think I know who I'd take here. The only guy that really comes to mind off the top of my head is... Yeah. I think Oshai Abaji is the only guy that I'm thinking of. Great minds think alike, sir. <laughs> yeah. Great minds think alike. So, in the case that the Hawks are keeping this pick, I think Abaji is, is good. He's another – you kind of play a little bit of guard, forward, kind of mix and match, and I think that's kind of where the Hawks need a little bit of extra help. Um, and he can score the ball. So – yeah, again, it's kind of a, a borderline playoff team, so just kind of take the best, not necessarily the best available, the best NBA-ready available, I guess, as weird as that sounds. Yeah, I I agree. I think he he's a guy that comes in and helps a contending team right now. I think his three-point percentage will transfer more than most other players because his progression as a player over the years he was so comfortable in his role like Kansas playing off the ball or on ball. Knockdown shooter, high level defender, a guy you can depend on mm-hmm. for a year. Now yeah, they'll have to figure out that rotation with your guy plus DeAndre Hunter plus him. They've they've got a bunch of dudes right. in that like positional two three area, but yeah, I'd I like the pick. So Rockets at seventeen. Honestly, this pick is pretty easy for me. Okay. This pick is pretty easy. You got Alper and Shingun. But like we said, <laughs> the big man and the forward spots, you got you got a lot to fill out. You're rebuilding. You got Paolo. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. <clears throat> but I think it helps to have another guy that could give you steady production from the jump and just plays good basketball. So... He's a guy that could play, like, small ball five. He could play four or three in some lineups. I'm going with EJ Liddell out of Ohio State. I think he's going to hit the three for you. I think he's going to defend at a high level. And I think he could be a leader of your team. Yeah. Which is important. I don't know if Jalen Green will ever be a leader of a team. Maybe not. Probably not. (laughs) I don't know if Paolo ever will be. I think EJ Liddell is the type of guy that could be a vocal leader and get people on the right track when they're on a court. Yeah. And make sure everybody stays motivated. You need those types of guys and these this type of core with these young guys, a bunch of ISO scores, a bunch of personalities. You need the he's still young. He's still like 22. Yeah. Maybe 21, 22, but he is experienced and more mature than several guys on that team. Yeah. And a guy that guys need to listen to. And at that age, having that type of guy I think is huge mm-hmm. for that type of team and that type of core. So, E.J. Liddell out of Ohio State. Yep. And all the playoff teams that thought they might be able to get E.J. Liddell are sad. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. I got the Bulls at 18. They're another weird team. It's been said that maybe Zach Levine will leave, but it's unsure. I'm going with the fact that I think that they're going to try to run it back. I heard they might be trying to trade for Rudy Gobert also. Yeah. So... This leads right into my draft pick. If they are unable to get a Rudy Gobert trade, they need a big man to pair alongside Vucevic. I think this would be run to the to the desk, run to the podium. You're taking Mark Williams here. I think that would be a perfect fit nice. alongside my guy Vucevic. If Mark Williams is still there, which I don't know if he's going to be in the actual draft. I think draft. he might go between like 12 and 15. Yeah. He might. So it might be hard for him to fall here, but I think you steal Mark Williams here because um, also the Wolves would probably love to have him as well. So I'm taking Mark Williams for the Bulls. 
Well, nice big shot blocker, defensive minded, gets easy dunks. He'll just protect the rim. Okay. Okay. So 19th pick, I have the Timberwolves. Interesting. I, I, they they have out of nowhere after like years of just being terrible, making decisions and making picks. In the past three years, they have hit on almost every decision they've made mm-hmm. in terms of getting young players. Whether it's Anthony Edwards, Jared Vanderbilt, who looked like he was gonna be, be he was going to become a journeyman. Yeah. But he could just have a spot in Minnesota with how hard he plays on both ends of the floor. Malik Beasley. They've they just they figured something out. I don't know how long it'll last, but as long as you have Anthony Edwards and Cat, it's possible. Yeah. So you could go with a more experienced option. They could go big or guard, honestly. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's a it's a really weird spot. Like how how much faith do you have in D'Angelo Russell staying with that team for yeah. the next few years, especially with Anthony Edwards becoming the face of the franchise? <sighs> this is this is an interesting one. So, with D'Angelo Russell, the possibility of not him be of him not being there for several more years. That might be too much of a swing at the 19th pick. This is hard. This is a I'll tough t- one. I'll tell you on mine, and it's maybe a bit of a swing. Uh, if I was the T-Wolves here, I would take the jump on Dallin Terry. You could do that. That's you just my opinion. That. You could pick one of the guards. Oh, you know what? This is a shot. <laughs> I I don't I don't think he's gonna go this high. But as a point guard option, a guy that can learn some things from Pat Beverly. He has so much offensive ability. He's a good passer too. He had a really good freshman year at Tennessee. He just happens to be just like six feet tall <laughs> and like a hundred and seventy something or hundred and eighty something pounds. Mm-hmm. Now he has he has like one of the highest verticals in combine history for a guy his size. Yep. I'm going to pick Kennedy Chandler out of Tennessee. All righty. Yeah. He had like a 40, like three or four inch vertical, but he's just a, I think he's a baller. He's a guy that I think if you put him in there, he, he just figures it out how to play the game because he's that level of talent. I wouldn't say he's what Gary, Darius Garland was. He has some of that ability that Darius Garland has. He's shifty. He's rear, He's very quick. Like I said, he can shoot. He is athletic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I shot in the dark Kennedy Chandler. Okay. Because he could be your point guard of the future. All right. And I have the Spurs at 20. Spurs, again, kind of a weird team. I don't know. Their draft could be interesting. But if I'm the Spurs here, uh, Yeah, I'm I'm a fan of – this seems like a, a Spurs pick. Failed on Josh Primo last year. Maybe not. But let's double down. We're going Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara. That is that is a Spurs pick. Yeah. I, they might just take him. And yeah. he's – I mean, he showed that he's got good size, some length. Um, in his five-on-five five drills – he was playing really good, shot really efficiently. Um, he's a guy you can pair alongside DeJounte Murray. At Santa Clara, he handled the ball well, so he could be an off guard that works well alongside Murray. But he doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, so he could maybe be even more of a, a spot-up shooter than he was in college. But he's got a lot of talent, and there's a lot of people that think he could even start climbing the draft board as we get closer to tomorrow. But... It just feels like a Spurs pick to me. So I'm going with Jalen Williams for upside. Okay. So Nuggets 21. Don't do it. (laughs) You know who I want to take, but it might be a bit of a stretch here. They, they need help Mm -hmm. and guys that can come in and help them now. 
So I'm looking at the experienced crop of college players. I like them, but I don't love them. I mean, I don't know if I'll be ready to take him that high. <clears throat> I don't think, I don't know if I'd take Dale and Terry because they have some guys like him. Yeah. And yeah, they, I think they need some offense more than defense. They're good enough on defense. Mm hmm. Malachi Branham is already off. Johnny Davis is already off. Man, oh man, I'm not taking Wendell Moore. That's that's who I'm not taking. <laughs> I'm sorry, Wendell. I just can't. Damn it! I'm taking Wendell Moore. <laughs> I'm gonna take Wendell Moore with the 21st pick. All righty. I'm not a big fan of him, but. He could be trustworthy and help. He he shot like almost 40% from threes last season. He's smart. He can defend. He could play for them from the jump. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like it, but I'm doing it. All right. All right. I got the Grizzlies at 22, and I think this is a pretty easy pick. I will mention real quick that we have kind of left Usman Jang <laughs> out to dry. But that's because we don't know a ton about him. He is the 11th ranked player on ESPN. He Somebody will probably take a chance yeah. on him. Guys that play in Australia, I have no gauge on. Yeah. I'm either extremely right or completely wrong on them. But he, he also could fall to one of these playoff teams where one of the playoff teams will take a risk on him because they can afford that risk. Yeah. Now, the Grizzlies, we just saw them make a big playoff run. Memphis hasn't missed in like three years. Yeah. and they, They've hit on every player. And I think this is a pretty – a pretty solid pick for them. They, I feel like their guard play and everything is pretty good. They're pretty set. Jaron Jackson keeps getting better and better. They traded for Steven Adams. In the regular season, he was really good for them, but in the yeah. playoffs, it was, yeah. And Steven Adams is starting to get a little bit older, so their backup is Xavier Tillman. I don't know if he's all that reliable. I'm just going with a defensive big man, Walker Kessler. I think it's a great fit. Big seven footer, just blocks everything that comes near him. I think it's great for a playoff team to get Walker Kessler. And to be honest, I have do not want the Bucks to get Walker Kessler. So I stealing like that him pick. away. I like it. So with this Philadelphia pick, I'm not going to waste time. I feel like. This this is going to be trying to make up for what you traded away in Mikael Bridges. Mm -hmm. And that's drafting Dalen Terry. Okay. Similar size, similar skill set. Not as experienced as Mikael Bridges was coming out of college. But I think he, he's improved at a shooter as a shooter, and I think he can keep getting better. Mm -hmm. He can be a high-level defender. And they're, they're shopping Matisse Thibel. Yeah. So I think taking Dalen Terry helps them. Okay. Yeah. I like that. Uh, all right. I'm not going to waste any time either. Um, I think the Bucks. we know the Bucks at this point. They're just looking for kind of whoever's whoever's available, one of the better availables. Um, and the unfortunate part is I'm looking at the shooting guards, and both of them have struggled at times from offense. So – I think I'm going to go with the slightly, slightly more NBA-ready guy. I'm going to take the risk on Jaden Hardy here. Then the G League last year, struggled offensively number-wise, but he's not afraid to go for it. Everybody and, still knows he's a bucket. Yes. Yeah, his, There's he, a lot of upside here. Bucks could use more guard play. I don't think it hurts them to take a risk because they're going to be back in the playoffs next year. Jaden Hardy for the Bucks. I love that pick. I love it. Who did you take with the San Antonio? <laughs> Jalen Williams. Oh, I took Jeremy Sohan. You took, yeah. Yeah. You took Jalen Williams. Yep. So you took Jaden Harvey. I was thinking about that for the San Antonio pick. You got Sohan. You got the long athletic raw player that could help you right now. You got Jalen Williams. This is when you go for your. Hmm. 
They could take another shot, but you know what? Yeah, let's take a shot. Let's do it. This is the Spurs we're talking about. Nikola Jovic. Okay. Yeah. Out of Serbia. Not Nikola Jokic. <laughs> this guy is a 6'7", six, 6'8", six, small forward, power forward type. He doesn't have a lot of handle. He has just enough to get a shot off, but he has a nice shot. He has a smooth game. Not sure how good of a defender he's going to be, but he, he's a skilled player and the type of guy the Spurs would take. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Nikola Jovic with that Spurs pick. Okay, I have the Mavs 26 pick, which was traded to the Rockets. Uh, so it's basically the Rockets pick at this point. Um, We already have the Rockets taking Paolo, and then we had them taking EJ Liddell. So... Hmm. We need somebody to pair possibly with Jalen Green. I don't know if Blake Wesley is that guy. I think they they might be stuffed at guards. Yeah. But you could. You could. I think what I'm going to do, because this is the part where you have to start not reaching, but you have to start getting a little creative. Yeah. Hmm. Only because I think he can play slightly like... Hmm. I think they just need to... Yeah, I'm just going to stick with that. I think they need to stretch the floor a little bit. I'm going to take Christian Brown here from Kansas. Um, He's a little bit bigger of a guard, spreads the floor. He shot 38% from three in college. He doesn't have to be the main guy. He's got a toughness to him. I think he'd work well on this team because he he can be just a guy that they can just get buckets for. Um, But he doesn't have to be the main part of the offense from Jalen Green or Bancaro. So, I'm going to go with Christian Brown. Okay, Christian Brown. We got Miami. They have a certain culture. They expect all their players to play a certain type of way. Mm-hmm. I think P.J. Tucker is leaving. Yeah, he opted out. You still got a pretty deep team. Adding a young guy with... Athleticism and potential to be a high-level defender. I'm going to have the Heat taking Kendall Brown out of Baylor. Okay. A- elite athlete. Super high vertical. He doesn't have a lot of game, but he still figures out a way to get buckets. Mm-hmm. He's almost 6'8". Yeah. I'll have Miami taking Kendall Brown. Okay. Um, and I get the Warriors pick, which is also interesting. Warriors always seem to do well in the draft. Yeah. I think this is the point where I'm going to take that risk. If Usman Jang is ranked 11th and he's, to me, at 28, he's kind of an in-betweener of a forward and, like, small forward or power forward. He's listed as a small forward, but he's 6'10". That fits into the mold of the Warriors wanting to play small ball. They got a lot of bigs. They haven't really solidified one as their go-to guy. I think I'm just going to take the best available for them at this point. I'm going to take Usman Jang. I think this is a pick that kind of falls in Memphis's lap, and once again, they just get a gem that they – figure out how to use perfectly. I'm going to take Patrick Baldwin. Okay. Top 10 player in last year's high school class. Decided to stay home in Milwaukee and play for his dad at Milwaukee. Went as bad as it could possibly go. Yep. But I'm honestly just going to chalk the year up to it is what it is. Mm Kind of like Zaire Williams last year when they drafted him out of Stanford. Yeah. You get Patrick Baldwin at 29. Forget the stats from last season. He's a high-level shooter. Right. 
The question is, can he defend and can he consistently give that effort on both ends? Mm -hmm. And I think in Memphis, they bring it out of him. He has the talent. He just has to be in the right place. And I think Patrick Baldwin in Memphis leads to good things. And I have the 30th pick from the Thunder. Again, we think they might try to package maybe some of their picks and maybe move up or something like that. But if they're going to stay at 30, I think the, maybe not the safest player, but the best fit for them at this point, I'm going to take Trevor Keels. Um, hmm. Kind of a a little bit of a two-way player. Um, play both sides of the ball. We saw him hit some big shots in the tournament. Plays good defense. We already drafted some big guys. Let's solidify some forwards. He's kind of he's kind of like Lou Dort. Yeah, yeah, in that similar vein. Yeah. So I think he could play a couple different positions in the NBA. So I think he's kind of just a, a decent fit for them at this point. Trevor Keels at thirty. All righty. That's our mock draft for the first round of the NBA draft. Uh, like I said, that will happen tomorrow. I'm sure we'll get plenty of picks wrong because it's going to be wild. Yes. The NBA always is. Um, and honestly, I'm almost more excited about the second round because there's a lot of like random guys that I think could turn into something. The more that I've, the more that I've looked at it, we didn't have Max Christie in our first round. We mm. didn't have uh, Caleb Houston in our first round. We didn't people. have Christian Coloco. Yep. Who could slide in there? I thought about Christian Coloco a couple times. He's been moving yeah. up boards. I like Justin Lewis out of Marquette. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Musa Diabate. I want to see where he goes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys towards the very, very end of the draft, too, yeah. that are interesting. Like I've said, I've said before, Kofi Coburn, Colin Gillespie, those guys are interesting. Yeah. Uh, I've even heard Kenneth Lofton Jr., he's been moving up. He's been losing weight, so people think if he can keep shredding some pounds, he could be dangerous. So he he might not get drafted. Right, two guys that might not get drafted: Jamal Cain, Gabe Brown. Both of those guys, yep. could have long NBA careers. Yep, with their height, athleticism, shooting ability, and defense. And don't forget about the, all the guys that we saw in the tournament: Johnny Juzang, Brady Manick, like you just said, Gabe yeah. Brown. So yeah, I, I think there's some guys that could could do something, even if they don't get drafted like you're saying. Um, so it, it will be interesting, and I'm I'm here for it. So, like I said, that's our NBA mock draft. We went over on time, but that's all right. It's a draft. We always do. This has been Views from the Sidelines. See you guys next time when we review the NBA draft, and we'll talk about how Chris's feelings are about the draft after. Oh, Jaden Ivey all the way. We're going to be disappointed.